What do you want? You, you want the moon? I think I finally know what I want to do with my life. I'm going to join the entertainment industry. Yay! Abby, everybody knows you can't make any money with an arts degree. Yeah. Won't it make me happy? Money can make you happy. That's right, boys and girls. At Skit Bags Radio, money can buy you happiness that creativity can. We always talk to the best in Hollywood and entertainment who are going to show you how to buy the happiness you deserve. Always on Dash Talk X. And you better buckle up, saddle in, take your phone off the hook because we got a brand new ball game. Let's go. All aboard! Hear ye, this is the court of Tampa, Florida. You. Mr. Rick Barrio Deal has been accused of finessing the minds of young women. <laughs> what say ye against these accusations, Mr. Rick Barrio? Fake news! Guilty as charged. <laughs> Ma'am, what do you say? What did Rick do to you? Well, um, he, he, he went kick a woo 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 and I was like, ooh, 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 I, I think, I think he's a skit bag. It's Skit Bags Radio, baby. We got Mr. Rick Barrio Dill in the spot. It's probably oh, CD, of oh, course, oh, Mr. Bad Boy with the whole gang, gang, yeah, gang, gang. Florida, uh, we jump in the water to get free, if you know what it be. Wow. Hot damn, girl. Yeah, 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 yeah. I had no idea how you were going to bring that one around. <laughs> <laughs> but you did. That's great. What's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? Rick, What's up? welcome to the show, man. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for being here. There's a lot of Tampa up in this piece. So there is. Yeah, yeah, wow. There is. Wow. Yeah, despite our best efforts. I know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Bro, you ain't going to tell me. <laughs> yeah. Well, where, where are you from? Where are you from? I am from Southern Indiana. Oh, okay. Oh, All right. Well, yeah. Yeah. come on, bro. Like, the like that's, a, that's so <laughs> many steps the, up yeah, above. Yeah, yeah really. It's yeah. the Tampa of the Midwest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Without the strip clubs. Similar people. Oh, no, we have strip clubs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, yeah, but not as good as Tampa. <laughs> no, not as good as Tampa. Not. No, they're not. <clears throat> Yeah. Yo, Rick. What's up, baby? What's what up? is up, man? Uh, for those of you who are listening and you don't know who the fuck Rick Dill is up in the building, uh, make sure you go and just type in the word uh, Vin because the rest of it is vintage trouble yeah, and baby. it will auto populate because it's the most fucking electrifying, amazing band I've ever seen live perform in modern day. Straight the fuck up. I've been a fan. I've been seeing you perform for over 10 years, bro. What's up, doggy? I remember you and me chilling and you did. <laughs> do, you, do you remember doing the Masterpiece Light It Up uh, rap remix for my Bib Lit class in freshman year of high school? <laughs> I do. Lay I do. down that track. Uh, yeah, yeah. And that's listening to like busting out G-Love. <laughs> Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. There's a yeah. lot of drugs I did back in the '60s, but, uh, <laughs> but I remember it. I remember it. Yeah, yeah. So, me and my past life too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I wasn't even born yet. But um, no, man. I, uh, I I'm so honored and so blessed to have you here, man. And uh, I'm so excited, dude. I'm I'm excited to get caught up on what's yeah. going on in your world. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm excited to introduce you to my fam that's uh, here, as well as my mother, the gorgeous mother to real, the left. Real fam and yes, I haven't, I haven't seen mom. My show fam. That. That's right. I haven't seen moms in a while. This is awesome. This is reunion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So why don't uh, why don't you give our listeners a little insight about like your background and how you got started into music? Because I know that you've always had this love story with playing music, but you probably got full into it a little bit later than I would have guessed just by looking at you. I feel like you would have been doing this professionally your whole life, but you 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 were doing it your whole life, I think, and then it, you kind of went in full time with. With trouble and with you yeah, know. With, with with vintage trouble. Yeah, I um I was I guess I was one of those kids that was really uh, I was lucky I I had fabulous parental uh, record collection around my house. So both my mom and my dad they weren't together very long when I was little, but they had such a diverse um, set of tastes. There was always great Beatles records. There was great Motown. There was and then there was other interesting things too. Like my dad liked. Southern rock, and my mom loved Tom Jones, and you know, and then you get into the Bee Gees, and just great songwriters and stuff like that. That was all kind of always around, and I just somehow, I got a hold of a guitar. I think I was like, I was like six years old or something. I just started. Oh, I think we were at a friend's house, and I was, I just started picking off the notes, the melody to to let it be, and and my parents were like, oh my god, this 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 little kid's got some talent. Let's let's try and water that flower, and um, and they did, and I think 
<clears throat> you know, I think one of the one of the things that w none of my relatives or none of none of I didn't know any of my grandparents or anything like that, but um, sort of musical talent just kind of wasn't even really it wasn't something that was in the family all that much. My dad played um, trumpet for a little while, got his jaw busted up when he was like sixteen chasing a girl, <laughs> and the uh, the boy, as one should as one should. Yeah. So <laughs> right. when, when apparently the uh, he didn't know that the girl wasn't fully um, broken up. <laughs> her boyfriend Dang. and my dad got punched in the jaw broke his jaw in like three mm. places and so he stopped playing trumpet so mm. he did have some talent but it was never anything that was like naturally around my house and and I was just always in school this was kind of back at a time when you could still sort of take music in school and it was and it was around so you had a you had a choice you know that, that was around for you and um, you know, in Tampa, I, I just was constantly, thank, thankfully, my mom, I always say, my mom, you know, single mother, if she had no money, um, she would still make sure that I made it to guitar lessons. And that was something that always um, just really, you know, to this day, it just, it, it, it means the world because if, if, if kids show a natural aptitude for something, I think um, a lot of it, it is up to the parents to to water it right and to you know mm -hmm. to help to help that get you know, go about yes. because yes. because on one level with parents there's there's the parents that just oh the kid's showing interest and then they just give them everything mm -hmm. and then they get bored with it really quick because the parents don't want their children you know what's the the age old adage you know we want them to have everything I didn't have right yeah. well part of that. Part of that thing is, I think, if, if you have everything, then you can't figure it out what it is you really, really want. Yeah, yeah, you need a little sacrifice in life. Exactly. Yeah. You got to hold back some. And, you know, my parents got divorced when I was really, really young. But the instrumentation and everything, the, the guitar was still there and um, music was still there. And I can remember, it's funny even... I, I after right after puberty, I got you know I, I inherited the deep voice and everything, which is you, you and I. You, we, you know, I used to be a three, tenor. Uh, <laughs> we could, you know, I love the, the. But I I used to sit in my room and I would I would fancy or I would imagine I would actually sit there with a uh, recorder and record as if I was a DJ and I would record the segment. So I would yeah. take one record and then how I would go from one record into yeah. the next record, you know, with the needle and everything. And I would talk to myself and even when it was time to go to bed or whatever, it was like, I was always kind of chasing after that. And so I think rather than give me everything, my, my, my mom was like, okay, well, I'm going to keep making you earn it. And when you got to a certain point, then you could earn the next level of, of that particular instrument or mm -hmm. something like that. And Love Gracie. Yeah, no, <laughs> props and mad shout out to Mama Sita and Big, and Big Chief too yeah, because yeah. because uh, to to even though my dad, you know, it was divorce my parents were divorced, my dad was always he always had really great soulful singers around and and that that was that's kind of a cornerstone that's like a bedrock of my very existence is is just great soul singers and when I got to a certain point and I and I needed um when I when I needed you know like a, a an improvement on the instrument or something, if my dad, there was times where my dad was doing bad, and then if my dad was doing good, he'd be like, okay, you've you know you've earned this, keep doing this well on your on your academics or whatever, and you can get an upgraded guitar or whatever. And That's a nice incentive. That, yeah, 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 yeah. That yeah. was a big push too, the academics, because you went that route sure. all through college. It wasn't like straight into I want to be in a band. I had it, that background. Yeah, you, you know that other background first. I, th I th as I, you were doing it. I I think it was funny too because I wanted to be. I wanted to. No. Uh, I was. I was interested in uh, uh, architecture, and I was interested in. Uh, and one of the things I didn't want to do was. I knew some of my teachers were these really, some of my music teachers were these incredibly interesting ind individuals that went to school for music and they were broke as fuck. Yeah. And I was like, I didn't, I was like, okay, well, I want to be, if I do want to be in music, I sure as fuck don't want to be broke. So I gotta, <laughs> I gotta, I gotta have some business acumen behind me too. But um, right around the time, it was like, I got into guitar and then the whole, it was funny because the whole rock thing was taken off at the time, like even hair metal. <laughs> and, and I just didn't get it. I was, um, <laughs> I was hanging out. Most, all my, most of my friends were, were, you know, I was the only white guy in, you know, like an all black, like crew. And it was great because I was getting into everything from, from Parliament Funkadelic and James Brown and, and Prince and Stevie Wonder. And, the rest of my friends that were my surfing buddies, like a lot of stuff, they would be getting into 
scorpion and white lion <laughs> and, and, and stuff. And I'd listen to it and it was cool, but it was never as cool to me as what Stevie Wonder is singing yeah. Saturn, you know, or, or whatever. Yeah. So that was, all, that was my question. I was going to ask you, like, when, <clears throat> when you're growing up, who are the artists that you admire that you grew up to? Who, who was on your record player? Who were you listening to during that time period? Well, I think that's, that was the kind of aha moment for me was because I was playing guitar and I could kind of play this guitar stuff and it interested me but um, right around then is when I that sort of convergence of the two. It was like I was playing guitar, but I was the only guy in my in in my sort of white friend surfer crew that was like playing guitar and stuff. And then uh, I was it was about sixteen, and I discovered Sly and the Family Stone, mm. and um, that was that was where I I heard this this tall skinny guy playing bass, and I didn't under, I didn't even understand the a zero resemblance to you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tall skinny, a little goofy, yeah. and was singing, dancing, and playing the bass like a motherfucker. And I was like I was like, well, first of all, well, it's got four strings instead of six. What's mm. up with that? And second of all, when I zeroed in on him, I was like, oh, that's what I hear. Like I realized at that point in time that I hear the bass yeah. I, I hear the I hear the low end yeah. and and that was what made me put the guitar down and then just started and then I was just obsessed I was going after every bass player I, you know I went mm. from Larry Graham it, it really led me to Prince which was funny because when you listen to Prince there's a great interview with Prince where they asked him what's his secret to uh, funk bass and he said Larry Graham next question so what happened was <laughs> from Larry Graham I went to Prince and from Prince I went back to Larry Graham nice. but uh, but th that was where at, right around that time uh, I was still kind of in, in, in high school but I was I was get, you know doing what a lot of kids do at that age is you're in, kind of in, playing in anybody's garage and doing anything I could to play and it wasn't too long after that I think it was like 17 I got a I got a gig um I got, a, I got I kind of got like a, a like a cover gig kind of where you had to start learning 200 songs you know <laughs> and I was again the, you know the only white guy in an all black band and and you're like learning all these cool cool songs and that was for me what what kind of took off on, uh, that was where I was like okay I want to I want to I, I want to I love this and I love the fact that I'm actually m making a little bit of money out of it and it, I was playing soccer at the time and to answer your question um, I tore my knee out, and it was great. It was right after. It was right after, after <laughs> it was high was school. Great. It was just, it was <laughs> yeah. ah, my knee no. out. Sounds, Sounds amazing, right? No. <laughs> no, but I tore my ACL out, and for whatever reason, you're a kid. You've just been playing soccer your whole life, and your your parents got you into it, and all your friends do it, and everything. And I and I was devoting a ton of time to playing soccer. And I tore my knee out. It was an ACL reconstruct. It was a whole year worth of rehab. Mm. And I and I had already had a bunch of gigs that were paying me more money than I would make if I had like a regular steady job that I couldn't do because I tore my knee out. I had to give it to somebody else. And I was like, why the fuck am I playing soccer anymore? I'm not getting paid to do that. Right. I was getting paid to play music. And at that point, when I tore my knee out, I I, I said, okay, I'm only gonna do I'm only gonna do college. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to college and then I'm gonna play in this band. Yeah. And um, and from there, it would just kind of it, it just kind of took off where I, where I was. I wound up going to school, and the architecture wasn't happening in college. And I wound up kind of going after two separate paths in college, and one was business, so I wouldn't be a broke motherfucker as a as a as a wise. Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. And then music because I wanted to be able to speak music, but at the same time, I was already learning the music, uh, you know, the language, kind of the, you know, of just the the improv language that you can only learn from being out there doing it or from just um, you know jumping in the deep end of the pool and learning everything I probably learned I learned thousands and thousands of songs you know all the crazy shit taste of honey everything that was cool it was like yeah. it was funny somebody was, uh, one of the girls that sings with us was over at my studio the other day and you know how when you when you turn on your record collection on iTunes mm -hmm. and it has all the the, the covers it has yeah. all the, mm -hmm. the, the artwork yeah. that's coming across She's like, you don't have a single white artist no. on, your, <laughs> on your collection. She's like, I don't even know who this this Lee Dorsey. I, I, I don't even have this one. And, <laughs> and it was just funny. But at that whole time period was just me kind of going to school from everything from you know from from Miles Davis to to, to Coltrane to. You know, to again, Prince is is, is my hero. Now, oh, I just yeah. I just Prince was obsessed. You introduced yeah, me yeah. To Prince. yeah, I was just you obsessed with concerts. Prince. I'm still obsessed with Prince. Really? He Likewise, was like, he was I was a... Prince on a cruise ship, by the way. Yes. Like, yeah, it was yeah. awesome. I so, love him. So, I mean, that was to me that was that was it. Where I where I was like, why, you know, I was always gonna do something until I, as far as a, a a kind of a backup, but until I didn't need the backup anymore. 
Well, one of my favorite things about you is, you know, you talk about soul and and all the music index that you listen to. You play the soulfulest instrument in your lineup of the uh, band, yeah. the bass. bass yeah. That is the through line. That's what provides the rhythm and the soul and the blues and the heart of yeah. all these tracks. Cool. So the, it, it like it's a no brainer. It's no wonder why you gravitated to that instrument if that's what you're hearing in your head. Yeah. And I'm so grateful that you did because you slapped the bass and killed the fucking shit out of it. I actually got a reference about the bass. It's like the offensive lineman of a band. You know what I mean? Because they do all the fucking hard work. If they don't do it right, this shit ain't going to happen out here and whatnot. Yeah. They get no goddamn credit for That's it. That's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I love like Raphael Sadiq, you know, and your and your kind of MD sort of types. That the 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 thing is, especially bass players that become producers, and that was sort of something that I that I grew into um, later. But, but I love the f I, one of my sort of principal kind of core things, and I guess it's back to you know the, my parents and the way I was raised. But one of the core things that I just sort of inherently do is I'm trying to figure out okay, how do I solve a problem? You know, and so the bass is one of those instruments that's perfectly set up for that because you are sort of the mortar in between you know a couple of different style of bricks or you know this this type of you know metal and and you're you're the mortar you're basically trying to figure out okay how can we get these two things to sort of live together and to your point about the bass being the most soulful instrument it is in rhythm and blues it is in soul it is in those types of genres rock a, a lot of times the bass is doubling the lead guitar the bass is really you know it's support. only there to support right. oh. the you know the lead guitar player really? when you when you listen to rock right. the, the oftentimes and it's not it's not true across the board you have your bands where you know they they do the thing muse and you got you know led zeppelin you can there are tons of bands that did do that but a lot of the core of rock in order to push the speakers because the lead guitar player it's sort of a, a thing with physics too the the guitar is to up balance there. out that frequency you, right you need uh, to you want to punch you want the speakers the to hit you so when you're playing, eh, 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 you, you you need the bottom end to do the same thing the guitar mm, player is right. doing. Whereas with with like with like hip hop and 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 soul and rhythm and blues, the bass player is is, is doing his own thing. Mm. I mean, that that is that sort of kind of soulful dance yeah. that you're talking about. And and you know the thing that I that I love is when you stick with the the drummer, but then when when a bass player and drummer are kind of weaving in and out of each other, to me that's where that's what's cool. Where a lot of times nowadays, you know, just bass and drums. You, a lot of songs are just bass and drums and a little sort yeah. of thing on the top, and that's it. Yeah, yeah, it's like the drum of the guitar section, you know, of the strings. You yeah. know what I mean? The bass, you know, it's almost you know, yeah. you could do a whole song without no actual drums, and somebody just killing it on the bass. You yeah, know yeah, what yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I think this is a perfect chance to touch on how did you meet the rest of your band members, and where did you guys find your sound? Tinder, because. baby, Tinder. <laughs> you know? Oh, I was swiping right like a motherfucker, and I found them bitches. Ding, you got a I match. I found them bitches. No, 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 no. There's um, a history. Yeah, there's a history. There's This was, um, I had two lives in Los Angeles, and I think, um, I think it's worth sort of t telling the story because I try to tell this to people that, uh, that I can see are either struggling in this city or, or are struggling to anywhere in any city trying to figure out what to do. And just making that change to Los Angeles to start that. Yeah, there was, there was, there was, I did, I did a seven year stint in, in Los Angeles uh, that was kind of after the period that, you know, we were talking about that started in, in Tampa where, where we, we met and everything. And that was like, I think many people's uh, or, uh, experience of Los Angeles where it was great, but I was hustling so hard. I had five different gigs that I was doing to pay the bills. And what happens is when you get settled enough to where you do have enough money to pay the bills, because that takes a while yeah. to, to, you know, to get there. You're still doing five different things, which means technically you're not doing anything at 100%. You're doing five different things at, you know, whatever, 20% or whatever. Yeah. And for me, I had another great, awful situation that wound up being, you know, fantastic. Was uh, I, it, everything had leveled out, and it was really sort of a, a, a bad time on a lot of different levels for me. And I had a friend who was in Nashville and, and uh, said, "Yo, man, you can, you can, you know, you can dance, you can read, you can play, you can, you, you're an engineer, you're a producer, you could go to Nashville and and kill it, and and you know, go and and." I was like, all right, and I went there, and this was before Nashville kind of took off. This was like, uh, this was 2009 was when Nashville, because I had moved to LA in 2002-ish and, um, and and had this whole period. Yeah, let me let me not get ahead of myself. So in LA, the, the seven years, I had these amazing friends, and I had, a, I had a lot, and I was doing five different jobs, but we were all commiserating 
mm. on what we hadn't achieved together. And as comforting as that is, it's also cancerous because mm. if you don't have us in, in my experience, if you don't have enough of a percentage in your circle that makes you feel inadequate and to some degree in a positive way mm. and that doesn't challenge you in a positive way, yeah. you're just sort of feeling comfortable with the plateau that you, yeah. you're, you're kind of, you know, out in. And um, I love these friends, but but we could, if, if I always say, if you love LA or you hate LA, either way you're right. And, um, you know, you, you, LA is, is one of those things where if everybody around you is, is oh man, I didn't get that audition. Mm. Oh yeah, I didn't get that audition. This fucking casting lady just did this yeah. to me. And it, it's like, it's if not you- not right for everybody. Yeah. It's, well, that kind well, of energy is everywhere. Well, you know, that'll, you know that'll, 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 ver that'll validate that kind of thing, you yeah. know? And well, you gotta kind of be like hypergamous, like almost like a woman who like looks at a guy for maybe what he has. Is he's a well-to-do man? Does he have good money? Does he have a good business? Can you hold me down? You know, can I sit at home and get drunk in the morning pretty much and be okay? And so, wear juicy this, butt pants. So you, you want to <laughs> be around people that's kind of doing stuff, you know, that's doing yeah. better, that's yeah. on a higher level. It's like soap operas. It's right. soap operas, some poor dude will show up one day. He's poor, he's broke, the whole town's clowning his ass. Yeah. And then he hangs around for two months, and by the end of, like, the second, third season, he's rich, just like all the rest of the people <laughs> in the soap opera. I'm rich! And so, that's the game. Yeah, but yeah, networking yeah. Through, yeah. That, yeah. Well, through that journey. Well, yeah, for, for me, I you. think it's important to illustrate that you're you're not there now. No, so no, no. How, well, well, that's, this what is what I'm saying. It, it, yeah. it, there's context to it, and I apologize for, for kind of being a bit, but the, no, re the reason why I'm... Don't apologize for shit, bro. Stop. <laughs> the reason why I'm putting that out there is because it gave me a certain experience that, that I didn't understand I was in until I was out of it. And then and then what happened was I, I, had, I had leveled out and, and there was some personal... There was a lot of personal uh, uh, difficulties that I was having in my per personal life. Um, things that I hadn't figured out with myself that were just massive problems from, you know, this thing. Back. And so the the opportunity to go to Nashville and cut LA off came up and I said, okay, yeah, cool. And um, uh, so I went and by doing that, I actually cut off all the five different sources of income that I had had in Los Angeles. And I, and I cut off most of those friends mm -hmm. completely like, like, a, like a bad drug habit. I just pieced out and then went to Nashville and... The, the thing about Nashville is I rejected that like a bad tr heart transplant too because because it just uh, I really LA was the only place I ever wanted to be it's the only place that that I really ever should be yeah. and and so what happened was um, I got I got the call from my dear friend Ty Taylor and we had been working on a bunch of music Ty, well, Ty Taylor God damn. we had been working on a bunch of music him and Nolly had been working on a bunch of music and this was about a year before I I had left Los Angeles that we were we all had five different gigs that we were doing at the time and it wasn't this it wasn't doing this we just got together to do music that we wanted to do and we were like well nobody's gonna fucking like this music but let's just mm -hmm. do this music that we want to do and we had no plans for it we were just doing these demos and I was I was so then flash forward to a year later and and Ty calls me up he's like look all my situations just fell out all of Nale's situations just fell out I know you just moved to Nashville but you know that shit we've been working on for the last year um do you, you do you want to come back to LA and and try and give this a go and I was like, fuck yeah, bro. I was on the next plane smoking. I literally, I was like, like give me I've out. been waiting so long. Uh, no, no, no. Well, I was, I, that, that's the thing. No disrespect to Nashville, but but right. it, it just, it just, it was just, it, it, it wasn't for me. I even went out for some No, but you uh, needed that moment. You needed that change yeah, yeah. for a minute. You ain't no fan of Florida Georgia yeah. Line? No, no, <laughs> fuck, no. Dude, but, you know, uh, I think it helped refresh your love for LA because being here for a long time, it can get kind of drab. It can get yeah. kind of blah. It can get, like yeah. you said, kind of, oh, oh, oh. And you kind of, it's kind of, it's just like when I go over to visit Philly. I go back to Philly and I realize how bad I love living in LA. You no, know what fucking I mean? a, bro. It's yeah. The same thing, <laughs> well, you know? and and yeah, no, exactly. And I got to reapproach LA with no friends. Yeah. Uh, as far as I had cut everybody off Fresh. and all the knowledge. Yeah. From previously. Yeah. So then what happened was everything was brand new to me. Mm -hmm. I got to choose brand new friends again. Ty and, and most of the people think that you know Ty introduced me to so many people that are now my dear, dear, dear lifelong friends. Mm -hmm. And these are people that are in the industry doing it. Whether yeah. they're whether whether they're musical directors, whether they're uh, choreographers for Pink or for Justin Timberlake, or I mean, you got all these people that are they're they're really fucking walking the walk, and that was so scary, inspiring, and just just like just it drove me, and so I got to reapproach L.A., and then all of a sudden, the same place, the same town that I was driving around being like uh, 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 previously, because 
of the previous friend group I had. Now I drive by that shit and I'm like, that's fucking awesome. Look at yeah. that guy taking a piss in the corner over there. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I love this. This is great. Yeah. I literally now yeah. live live at live at Sunset in La Brea, and and yesterday there was a there was an old there was an old lady on a little scooter with a big giant like like almost like a like a grocery cart on the front of her scooter and I heard it going down the street going eh, going down the street and I look out and there's this old lady with with a bunch of just like like you could tell it's like her home belongings in this scooter and she's not wearing any pants <laughs> <laughs> going down the road in the scooter and I'm looking outside and I'm like god I love LA yeah. I, it's just cuz yeah. you get you know it's all perspective you yeah. know and yeah. LA has this beautiful to me Every you know, LA has this delusional energy that is everywhere, and and Damn. it's like living in an actual movie. Like you see all these weird characters in movies, and that that type of shit actually happens out here on the street. Absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. If you go into Starbucks and if you're pissed off because there's a bunch of you know what whatever failed screenwriters or whatever in Starbucks, it's like everybody's in there with a with with a dream, with a delu you know, with an energy. And yeah, sure, 80, 90 percent of it's not going to make it, but. But if you pipe into that in a way that, hey, that's something off a tree that I can I can pick off, you know, and I can just be inspired by the fact that there are people that are trying to create shit around here. I don't even, however fucked up it is, they're trying to create shit. And, that, you know, when you, if you pipe into that side of the delusional energy, to me, it's never ending. It's everywhere. If you look at that delusional energy as, oh, look at that girl. She thinks she can sing. Yes. She can't sing. Then you're just gonna then you're just gonna feed into that kind of energy, and LA's gonna swallow you up. It's gonna chew you up and spit you out. So when I finally realized that as being the secret, man, I, I every day I walk yeah. around this city. I, it's cool too because I get I get to ride my bike from there at Sunset and La Brea to the LA or to the what is it LA Fitness or whatever, mm -hmm. and I get to go through my street, which is dope, it's just dope as hell. And then I go through a bunch of homeless kind of like little homeless encampment. Then I go up. A little sort of suspect, like strip club area, and then I'm on suspect. the, and then and then I'm on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, and every day there's yeah. a bunch of Japanese people, you know, taking pictures next to Kermit the Frog. I knew you tried to run me yeah, over. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's that, it's that, it's like there's a bunch of people from Indiana, no disrespect, that are like, you know, <laughs> right. that are, they're doing the tourist van thing, and they're yeah. taking the picture next to Pat Sajak, and they're fucking yeah. proud about it and shit, and it's like such a big deal that it's like, yeah. for them, it's such a big deal, and I'm like, man, every time you get to run through that gamut of rich yeah. and poor and every color on the yeah. fucking palette you could ever dream is in that almost four block stint that I get to ride my bike yeah. to the gym and I'm like man you can't beat that like yeah, I, I, yeah. I can't, you can, if I, you put, take me away and put me in like a suburb or, or some kind of shit I just, I'll just shoot myself yeah like, yeah you have to be work. accepting of that type of thing and you have to have mm -hmm. that mind frame well, we didn't have it before, maybe. Yeah. Absolutely. You have Absolutely. To have, you have yeah. To be, yeah. This is okay. We it, were just talking about that on the way mm. here. We we came down western, and it just like jogged a memory in front of the food for less. Oh and my having god! Having a wreck when I when I, was I in wreck. The car with him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was like and having to tra chase down these people to get in. It was mm. like okay. Yeah. yeah. Or or the guy that got off the bus, this big 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 guy in a pink tutu. Yeah, right. I was right. like, okay. Yeah. Only, I mean, it was <laughs> like flashbacks. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was like, yeah. balls you know, out. It was, yeah, right. it was, yeah. You know, or they're driving down the, pushing their cart down the road with all these bags. Yeah. Okay, yeah. They've got yeah. their house attached to them. Yeah. You have to be okay with that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, for me, it's like a never ending well of inspiration. Because yeah, you see so many things from a human actual pooping on the curb in front of you. You know, to some like really nice person that does something like, like I've lost my wallet and gotten it back in LA. I've lost my phone and Absolutely. gotten it back. Like so you would think, Oh, this is a horrible place or everybody I mean, people have I've lost my whole book bag. <laughs> you lose yeah. your wallet in Philly, right, right, that right. shit is gone. And it's just right. like sure. you, no, exactly. That's an East Coast thing. It's like you yeah. guys said, the whole diaspora from this the worst looking situation to the best situation, it can come in any kind of direction with the best of prizes. And that's you want to look at that side of LA and take advantage of what that is and pull from that yeah. and use that to build yourself out. Yeah, I, I say I always say, you know, we get to, we're very fortunate, you know, of, with Vintage Trouble, we 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 get to travel all over the world and and we get to do what we love to do. And it is it is I, I have everything a kid could ever ask for. But every time I come back to LA, I'm like, no matter what city I've gone to. LA has the most colors to paint with of any city in the world and you know and, and in a way to where I, I love it because even when you go away for three months on tour or something and then you come back the city looks different. It's mm -hmm. different. It's it's already turned over on and itself. And your shows here are always different. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And this is what I was going to ask you. We talked about energy and we talked a lot about like you know projecting outward and harnessing your energy. 
I mentioned earlier, you guys are some of the best live performers I've literally ever seen in my entire life. You guys bring a presence, a, a vibe, and energy that projects in in all mannerisms of your facial expressions to your body of movement to jamming out. Like you perform in the full definition of the word. <laughs> Thank you, brother. And oh. Yeah, and I think that's notable because a lot of people don't these days. And I wanted to say, where do you draw that energy from? Is it for, uh, from the music, from the show, from the fans? A combination. How What's that process like getting heart. on stage now? It's and, your heart and yeah. passion. If you don't, you uh, project. Mom, I love that. you, mom. Yeah. I wasn't asking you. You're not the, <laughs> no, no, no. You're not the, you're not the rock star here. No, All right, saying, darling. You know, I love you. When people, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm no, just no. giving you crap. When people <laughs> put that out there, it typically comes from their heart and their passion. Yeah. I mean, you know, they show it. Not that other artists don't do that, but it's a different level. Well, I think, you know, there's there's several answers to that question. I think, you know, first and foremost is exactly what you said is you, you uh, you know, one of the things I was doing the first, my first seven years, my first stint in LA was I was doing a lot of things to pay the bills, right? So if I saw a project, I was like, okay, it's not the project that I'm, that, that I'm dreaming of or that, you know, naturally comes out from inside me, but uh, I can make that successful or I can be successful inside that. And I think um, what happens is then it's a, there's a certain level of, of sacrifice that you do to either, you know, have a, have the gig or continue to keep the gig. And the blessing that happened with Vintage Trouble was we got in a room and the first time we got in a room, it was like, we don't give a fuck if anybody comes out to see us at all. Yeah. The reason why we're in here in this room is there's four guys that we we were like we're just going to do what the music that we want to do that we like because at the time in 2010 there was a lot of just sort of formulaic everybody was playing uh, to tracks and I think what happens is it's it's sort of like I, I heard somebody say that they're not even teaching cursive in school anymore right they're not. Right. No, yeah. no, it's it's minimal, right? They don't teach it anymore. Okay, so that's a that's a perfect example of, uh, for me, what I'm what I was kind of alluding to, which is if you don't have to get the basics, and if there's a computer that is that is going to automatically do all the calculations for you, you don't have to learn how to do like long division and stuff like that. Well, we we all came from a, a, a time where you sat in a room for twelve hours trying to learn how to do that. Fucking the baseline from seven 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 ninety three eleven, which I'm still trying to learn how to do, you know, right? Or or from hair, from Larry Graham, or whatever. And and I think when you so so when there are computers now that can do that for you and get you out on, uh, you know, get you out in front of people, it removes a little bit of the to me the the, the sort of natural passion that that would have to come yeah. from the fact that you uh -huh. devoted your life to the craft. You're you're now you're maybe you can. Put the passion in a different way, but but there's other things that help aid that to where you don't actually have to do it. Mm -hmm. And I'll sort of you know talk about the difference between a musician and a DJ. Yeah, well, sure, sure, sure. Well, yeah, I would, well, and I would never, I would, I would say never. Hip hop has that problem with the uh, trap music now. Yeah. How it's yeah. musician over the air. Well, now with all the computers and it's real easy. It's not about your lyrics it's anymore. It's about auto tune the melody, and mumble rap. Yeah, right. The beat, <laughs> and then your lyrics are like third afterwards and right. whatnot. And it's just like they don't. It it, it kind of has watered down the value of it and whatnot. And like he said, there's no passion in it. There's no loving because what they're doing, they're making what they think people already like. You're making what you don't give a fuck whether they like it or they don't. Matter of fact, I'm going to make something I know you hate. Right. No, I won't. <laughs> you know no. I mean? But no. we got lucky because <laughs> I, I, we did that with yeah. that attitude. We had yeah. a very fuck you attitude and our yeah. first show, tons of people showed up. We got offered a weekly gig after our first show. Oh. And then before we knew it, we were playing four times a week in Los Angeles. Um, we were getting paid all, and we had Los Angeles covered. We did four different locations. We did downtown. We did west side. We did... Um, uh, right in the middle, right here, some kind of La Brea and like Melrose area, and then we did uh, up in like uh, what we called the Upper East Side, which is Los Feliz, <laughs> <laughs> and um, and you know um, we had it kind of surrounded, but but and it just sort of took off, and I think that sort of um, that that honesty and that authenticity shined through and then we we literally the first gig that we had we had to cover three to four hours and we had eight songs mm -hmm. and we were like how the fuck are we going to do this so we, we started right on stage realizing that okay well, we've got to start exercising our improv chops but at that point we had all had a lifetime worth of 
hard knocks and experience to put us in that situation where we had to cover with eight songs we had 25 minutes worth of music and we had to cover four hours it's like how are we going to do it we got to pull on a lot of that experience and then that and then what happened was it worked and when it worked it gave us this swagger and then once we had the swagger it was off to the races because then you once you have that confidence and you have the experience and the uh, and the 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 toolbox to pull anything out of your toolbox at, at any time well now you're, you're you're fucking dangerous look at guys like you know like justin timberlake and you, you just see and you know a lot lots of guys you know you kind of going back to your hip-hop thing i'm i'm what was it J, J, what is it jay-z's dakota is that the book name but I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm reading that book again for the second time and it's so funny because if you look at the lyr- if you look at lyricists as as a true 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 art form it it is to see, to hear him break down all the songs and where his references came from at the time and mm-hmm. you know like Eminem and these true wordsmiths and mm-hmm. you know and Kendrick and you got these guys that are these true true wordsmiths yeah. you, you realize that that 10 hours in a room 12 hours in a room I'm talking about sitting there trying to learn 7779311 it's the same thing for somebody else but if you got yeah. a computer that's fucking spitting it out or you got a rhyme and dictionary online that's telling yeah. you some rhyme that's lame as fuck yeah. it's going to be watered down yeah. and I think that's where we we wound up getting the passion because we we're doing shit that we that we really really love and and people connect with that honestly i think i think you know contrived shit and faking it people see through that really really fast yeah, yeah. you know so yeah. I, I think we just got we just got lucky and then we we played so much that that uh it just it just turned into like a badge of honor for us. If we weren't if there wasn't blood on the stage, we you know we hadn't done we hadn't done it. And we dress up and we would we we would always. I was gonna it. say, you, when did you guys put on the suits? Because I feel like that's when you became superheroes. <laughs> it's so funny you say that. That's so cool. I, it was funny. I even yeah. I it, I look. I'm a musical theater guy. If yeah. it fits the performance, it you, is. you're you're it stepping is. into the role of of, of that. Clark, and Clark you, Kent's leaving. Exactly. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. It's funny that we we equated it to putting on our, our sort of superhero costumes as well. We it took a second. Like we started off kind of wanting to be in that fifties and late fifties, early sixties um, uh, fashion. We're all we're all real fashion heads, and but one of the things Ty was Ty, you know Ty was uh, like like take you know take a look at at Ike and Tina's band. And I was reading at the time I was reading Keith Richards' book, and he was talking about going out on tour with with Ike and Tina Turner. And he was like, the Stones would show up, and we'd be in kind of these like secondhand shirts and stuff like that. And uh, and and um, Ike Turner's band would show up, and these motherfuckers would be clean, showing up to sound check, like they'd be they'd be clean, and they'd have another suit draped over their back for later for the show. That's awesome. And, and then <laughs> you know, and he was like, and Keith was like, I I was always impressed by that because there is something to your psyche. When you present yourself, I think in a way that to where you have put, uh, you've consciously put this on. You you put yeah. intention behind your presentation, and and I think a lot of that has to do with how you, your clothes feel from the inside. It's one thing if okay, cool, hey, I'm going to get a lot of attention, so I'm going to put on a shiny sequins jacket. That's a Vegas approach to the presentation, and I think mm-hmm. where we went with it was much more like. No, it was all based out of respect. Like the fact that somebody was showing up and wanted to pay to see us, yeah. we are going to respect you. And so we dressed in a way that felt, you know, res- yeah. respectful. Yeah, yeah. It's like I can at least get up there and look good for you. Yeah, you know yeah. I'm going to put, I'm going to come in and, you know, you play all these festivals and no disrespect. I love feeling comfortable as well, but. Ty, Ty had a way that he put it is so perfect, like so many things that he puts uh, puts into words. But uh, he said that basically, you know, we, we coined the phrase "come dressy, leave messy." Hmm. And the fact was, when you show up and when you show up in a in and you're all put together, like imagine you come to a wedding, right? But by the you know, and then you get to the reception and the ties kind of getting loose and shit like that. And then somebody spills wine all over the bride's dress or something, and somebody, you know, roofies one of the groomsmen or something like that. And and then it starts turning into a real party that you want to be. At. <laughs> I was like, this yeah. wedding's yeah. awesome. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> now you want to be there. And when you want to be there, you start rolling up your sleeves and shit. And you know, you got you got fucking punch spilled all over your pants. Yeah. And you leave there and you're dragging your leg and you got your one black eye and you can't remember yeah. shit. And you're like, okay, now now it was a fun was, time, you know. Yeah. So you, you have a way of wiggling it's like there's something about being confined that makes you want to figure a way to wiggle out of it and the act of getting from the confined to the wiggling out that was what we sort of you know we put on as our as our superhero costume somebody early on said how does it feel to know that your superpower is to cause dance? Huh. <laughs> and we were like, that's Love fucking that. dope. Yeah. Well, so yeah. so we did yeah. that. And to be honest, lately, 
we got away from the uh, we got away from the suits a little bit because about two years ago we were playing uh, Byron Bay Blues Fest and one of a dear friend of ours Brian London a bad motherfucker mm. he's played with everybody from I mean you, I could brag about him forever but Katy Perry and Lady Gaga and Bruno and shit and so we called him up because we were like wanting to expand and kind of wanting to change our sound. And and we were like we were like yo man can you give us a referral for like a keyboard player that can sing and you know come come out with a piano player a keyboard organ player and he was like motherfucker why don't you ask me and we're like we're like, we're like well we don't think we can afford you and he's like well shit man and he's like y'all are some bad motherfuckers I want to go out with you so he went out but he was like but look I got to tell you my thing is more Jimi Hendrix hmm. and he's like well, my thing is late sixties and to that point in time we were we were late fifties early sixties kind of where we were sitting Ooh. at. Okay, so this is an educational moment for the average person back home. What is the difference between like late fifties, late sixties music? What's the what's the difference in that? That's thing? a great question. Okay, so so you have <laughs> your psychedelic period, kind of kind of Vietnam, mm -hmm. um, sort of kind of uh, cultural awakening that was more prevalent in the late sixties. Like sixty seven, sixty eight. Oh. Yeah, you see it because you have that you have Woodstock. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, so it turns, the, it turns into the it turns into very acidy the doors and everything like that. Okay. Whereas you, you look at the late fifties, early sixties, uh, black music is moving away from uh, only being you know church music and being a little more secular. And you have people that are leaving. Like Aretha was treading the line, and yeah. Sam Cooke was treading the line between yeah. leaving and would catch a lot of shit for it for singing you know secular music and stuff like that. Yeah. And so there was still a lot of presentation in the late fifties and early sixties mm -hmm. where there was that that. Thin tie and very, you know, suits and respectful. Yeah, look at look clean. at the album covers between. You know, all you got to do yeah. is look at the album covers between the time period, and it'll kind of tell you the same thing. Very clean, late fifties, early sixties. Yeah. A lot of lot of respect and, and, and you know Motown and and stuff like that. And then and then you know Stack starts to wiggle it loose, and then you have and then you have the kind of flower child movement and yeah. everything like that. That's the late sixties. Basically, they're dressed like me on the damn cover. It's yeah, so no, like exactly. A late 60s exactly. Rock album right here. Exactly. Yeah. And that's where and Brian came in with that. And Brian, he's man, he is a he is a sexy man. He's a very very good looking man. So he comes in and he's got his. He's got his shirt down to like his belly button, you know, like his sleeve, you know, it's all the way down. He's got the, he's got the beads, right? You know, we're like, oh shit, okay, Ty and I, like, right, we got to do a few more sit ups, you know, hang with him. All right, cool, cool. Got the young guy on the team, you know, the rookie. Right. And so we started loosening up the, the look a little bit. And the funny thing is, I think we did a, we did a, we did a couple of years, we did a couple of tour cycles on that. And for me now, I've, I've, in this break, I've been coming right back to, the, you know, the superheroes got to readjust. Even Spider-Man took an adjustment of his mm -hmm. costume and shit, but mm -hmm. then, you know, eventually it starts to come back to the simple that he was. And I think I've, I've at least for myself, I've been kind of looping back around to the to the suit and, the you know, that look of, of putting the superhero costume on and... and I might actually go even more clean than I there did to go. start with. Like, go there back, you know. back, back, make it even tighter. Yeah, it's like a rebirth almost. Almost like you're a butterfly yeah. cocooning and, like, you guys almost get reborn every time you perform. It's yeah. kind of kind of deep. Yeah. Do you have a favorite moment from your past tours? Like, a favorite memory? Bruh. Maybe a favorite performance? What what stands out to you? Bruh. Yeah, I, what, how how much longer we got? Yeah, exactly. I don't know what the time limit is. <laughs> no, on the no, show. we got we got we'll, no, till whatever. I don't I don't know for how many people that are, that are listening that know you know of the band, but uh, but again, we're 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 incredibly fortunate. We we after a year in L.A., we got to take off uh, and uh, we went over to London. It was the first time any of us. Um, it was the first time any of us had really uh, left the country to go play music. And we went over there to do uh, a couple of showcases to try and get some attention because basically we had taken over. LA, uh, we were doing four all original gigs, three hour gigs, four hour gigs sometimes, four times a week, and they were all sold out. And you, we, we used to say, God, you can't get a friend of yours to come out. You can't get a friend to come out and see your a friend of yours band. Yes. But you can get people to go to the par a party if it's the right party mm -hmm. four times a week. And that's what we realized is we just had created a thing to where Vintage Trouble was cool, but the coolest thing was the people that were coming out the coolest thing about the gigs was Vintage Trouble was a conduit for when we took a break. Everybody that would be outside, you'd have all these like painters and poets and dancers yeah. and all these people and they yeah. would be like, they would talk and so it wound up being the place to be. Mm -hmm. Plus there was Vintage Trouble gigs in the middle and so what we did is we went to uh, when we got our manager, Doc McGee, the kind of famous Doc McGee who managed everybody from James Brown to, to Isaac Hayes to Diana Ross and uh, most notably like Guns N' Roses and 
Motley Crue and stuff. When he, we got him, he he pulled us in his office the first day and he said, "What do you guys want to do?" And we said, "We said, fuck America. We what we just did in Los Angeles. We've already taken over Los Angeles. <laughs> right. So why do we need to go take over? No disrespect to Indiana, but I'm going to keep picking on it for the. <laughs> There's not a whole lot to take over. No, no, that's true. That's true. That's true. That's true. Mike Pence, man. God. Okay. All right. Sorry. Sorry, man. We ain't even going to go there. But I, I could pick on Florida too. But that's too easy. That's low hanging fruit. You know? No, but we, we went to Doc and we were like, he was like, "What do you want to do?" And we said, "We want to go do the same thing in London because we had, because so many at the time we were big Amy Winehouse heads and and we and we were like, you know, we just want to go. We want to go fucking post up in Camden. Like we were just like, it just looks so cool. And Doc was like, yeah, that makes sense. We were like, we want to do what we just did in Los Angeles. Let's let's go do it in London because we can do it. We want to sit up in London for give us three months in London." And we'll we'll take the place over, hmm. and so we went over there, and uh, Doc set up some showcases with some people, some magazines and stuff like that. And we went over there literally for, I think it was for uh, a week, and we wound up. Uh, we we went over there, did three show three showcases, three days in a row, came back, and I think we were home for a couple of days. We got the call. They were like, uh, there was a show called Later with Jules Holland, and it called us, and they were like, they want you to come right back to do the Jules Holland show. And for a lot of people who don't know, it's basically the largest music show in the world. Wow. It, for, its th for its throw, when you add it all aggregate, when it throws on the replay over BBC and over, and over Europe and over Australia and into Japan and everything, its reach is bigger than like the Super Bowl. Oh. So it's an incredible music show. They usually, they have five or six bands in the round and they do it live and all they do is each band plays and then they just turn the camera like you know, a quarter or a quarter degree on the clock to the next band, That's and they so just crazy. go around in circle, and you're doing it all live in the That's moment. That's so crazy. It's all so fucking it's like live. A, a battle of the bands, almost kind of thing. No, it's not a battle. It's a. It's a, everybody is friendly. As a matter of fact, they even oh. start off the show where there's like this kind of jam where everybody plays in a certain key, and the, it's uh, it's the guy from Squeeze is Jules Holland. And he's a keyboard player from Squeeze. It's his show, and it, the thing about it is, it is it is respected. As whereas whereas all late night and live shows in in this country for the most part lost their respect a long time ago, mm. um, this this show is respected as a tastemaker because he's he's like an aficionado. So you don't get on there because you have money and you grease his palms. You get on there because he thinks you have something to contribute like you, to you, music. You can't buy your way onto this. No, show. no, no. Yeah. And it's not about necessarily about popularity and stuff. He yeah. he he'll he has you on and his team have you on because they think you have something to contribute to music. And so we went over there, we did the Jules Holland show and we went over there really for, you know, for a week and before we left the BBC parking lot, uh, we did that show. It's, you could Google it now. It's Vintage Trouble, later Jules Holland tie wore the famous yellow jacket and uh, before we could even leave the BBC parking lot, uh, our lives were changed. We were like the number four most tweeted thing in the world and, and everything took off that night. Our, our, we, our, we were selling our little demo that we made. For, we recorded our first record, the Bomb Shelter Sessions, in three days. Damn. That's what I was going to ask you. How long from the first time you guys played together till laying down Bomb Shelter? The three months. Jesus Christ. And we recorded that record in three days. And so we were still over in, when we played Jules Holland, we were playing on that demo. It was a garage recording. And, and <laughs> wow. we were selling it off it our is. server. Why not? We were selling it off our server. And before we even got back to our hotel, our server was crashing. And we were getting so many orders and everything like that that we were having to, we were there with, with a Sharpie till seven in the morning filling things out. We literally were going to the post office in, in London with bags full of CDs and stuff like that. And so... To your long-winded answer to your question, that was that you you know that kicked off that in and of itself that moment on BBC Live and you're you're going to that many households and you that in and of itself is kind of a kid's dream and it kickstarted everything and I, you know I've been keeping a diary or a journal for like for like thirty years and uh, one day there's going to be a book and about it because people wouldn't believe everything that's happened since then a lot of things people wouldn't believe I mean we we from there we got to tour with instantly we got the offer to tour with Brian May and we went out three three we went out with him and uh, and then we got the tour with Bon Jovi and we were playing stadiums mm. and before I knew it I, I was I literally went straight from eye surgery. I had a vitrectomy, Ooh, and, yeah. and I went straight from eye surgery. Ty dragged me onto the to the to the train and got me to Edinburgh, Scotland, to play in front of fifty thousand people on stage with Bon Jovi later that day. I remember throwing up a sound check, throwing us up Jesus. as soon as I got off the stage. Yeah. Could barely even see; he was dizzy and everything. That's fucking rock and roll, right? Yeah, there. no, no, no. Yeah. And then we got <laughs> Lenny Kravitz the tour. We got two, two tours with Lenny. We did, we did uh, the entire Who Quadrophenia tour, but. I mean, there's there's so many things from we we broke the Guinness Book of World Records opening up for ACDC in Emola, Spain, 135,000 people. It was, it was insane. 
Dude, I mean, what is that like? Because that's that that has got to be an experience that, uh, first of all, nobody really gets an opportunity to uh, enjoy an experience like yourself. But like a hundred and thirty-five thousand people, what is that like playing in front of them? Because it's got to be different than you know the energy of the club when uh, you're in LA and you got your fans right in front of you and everybody's dancing. Now you're in a stadium and are you far removed from the front row? Is everybody right up to the stage? I know Ty likes to go into the audience and be a showman yeah. how how do you play to that large of group i think uh, you know f we we have there's the kids dream we talk about this a lot you know the kids dream where you're jumping up and down on the bed with the broom handle and for me it was purple rain and i was reliving every scene from purple rain i was i was i was just gonna be fucking prince i was gonna have you know prince swagger and um there is the you know the the, the that to me is is kind of that's the kids dream that did manifest itself. We we you know when we would play in Los Feliz, and you'd have a packed house, and and people were like pouring out the side. Like you could only fit maybe 120 people in the place, mm. and they're pouring outside, and it's so hot in there. Everybody's stripping off clothes, and the windows are fogged up. You can't even see outside because it's so hot. That is that doesn't sound fun at all. That, no, that's outstandingly <laughs> that, fun. No, that and that people like are taking shit. off clothes, and it's just nothing but people dancing, yeah. and, dancing to your music. That's a kid's dream, and that's an amazing. Yeah. Well, the adult dream is that you know, kind of going out on the stage, and you've got people farther than the eye can see, and yeah. that's that's a whole thing. Yeah. yeah, that's the that's the adult dream, and that's the one you get to you know, you kind of bra you can brag about in radio interviews and stuff like that, and it is amazing. Mm. It's all equally amazing, but. I mean, you know, how much more meaningful is that than, than you know, somebody falling down crying because they heard nobody told me at, 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 at you, you know, and falling down crying because they, yeah, they lost a friend itself. of theirs to suicide and they come yeah. up to you at the booth and they say, I just lost a friend of mine to suicide and your your song, I've been listening to it nothing nonstop for the last week and a half and yeah. it's helped me get through not wanting com to commit suicide myself. And yeah. so... Juxtapose your that, that those dreams we're talking about over that. That's a different kind of dream, and so to me, I think it just kind of all gets back to the passion part. The the you know when you're doing something that you really love to do, um, and you're at the center of kind of you know your the ability. I just finished reading another book called Ikigai. I don't know if you guys know about it. About the, hmm. the it's the there's a couple of blue zone places in the world, and um, where they, they call them the blue zone, where they they they're people that live the longest. Oh, right. really? And the, yeah, and there's certain zones in the world, and they're and they've tried like to study. Like Japan is one, right? Okinawa and Japan. Yeah, there's really? a little place, in it, and it's uh, Ikigai, Ikigai. Is basically it's the convergence of when you're in perfect f sort of flow of your life's purpose. It has to do with what you're good at. You know what? Um, you know what you, what you, you vocationally what you can do. What what uh, you can get paid to do. Um, you know what inspires you, and if you're if you look at those four things at the, and as a Venn diagram, the very very center, the, the, that sort of super center, is where you are doing your absolute life's purpose. Mm -hmm. And I think that you know the quest is well, most of the people in, in a lot of the blue zones, um, they they tend to be really great at finding their life purpose. center and keeping the things that keep them away from their sort of bliss. You know, they keep those things away in a better manner than most other people across the world. And hmm. that's hard in and of itself is sort of weeding out stress and not letting things in and, and everything like that. And so to me, uh, you know, you can lose your way, but the, 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 be the faster I find my way back to that, the, the, the better it gets at, at really realizing that every day you get to do something and, and, and connect. Whatever it is, little or small, is fucking massive. That's that's as big as a gig for 135,000 people or whatever. I mean, you know, it's fascinating hearing you talk about this because I'm I'm sitting here listening to you describe this, um, your outlook on on the world and on life, and then I'm sitting here saying your music has helped me through stuff like the emotional journey that you guys take your audience to on some of your like nobody told me, man, like yeah. definitely cried to that song before. For sure. Me too. And Live. Of right? course. Yeah, sure. So like, it's like therapeutic. You're talking about this, but like, it's got to be a release of energy for you writing this and creating this and then a ventricle process, seeing it reciprocated in your audience members, man. So yeah. like, I, I don't know. I was just admiring oh, that, that thanks, statement, man. man. That's, yeah. that's it's funny. All. It's funny too, because you, you, you know, for a band like us, you know, the guys are a little older and stuff like that. You, you, you we still 
you know, there's so many struggles that are still in trying to get that, trying to get that message across. And you realize there's so much noise that as hard as you work on something, you can do everything right. And then there's still so many things that are sort of out of your control that determine whether or not that gets heard or not, you know, and, and as a band like us, we've, you know, we've played thousands of shows to the point to where um, our favorite artist, my favorite artist, I, I, you know, is Prince. He's, he's the Mount Everest of, you know, Mount Everest. Yeah. Like, and when you look at the stuff that he wrote for other people, when you, you know, under pseudonyms, because he couldn't, he was contractually obligated not oh, to yeah. do anything for other people. That's that's why he wrote Slave on his face. So he was writing stuff under the name of Jamie Starr or Alexander Nevermind or Joey oh, Coco. Really? Yeah. So, that would be a cool kind of movie kind of concert. I never knew about that. Yeah, probably. absolutely. There's a, huh. there's a, as a matter of fact, now that he's passed his, uh, I think he's BMI, but you can, the, his catalog, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. It makes like Bob Dylan look like, you know, like he hasn't put out anything. It's, <laughs> it's, it's absurd because he would write whole records for Bonnie Raitt that never saw the light of day. He did some shit for like Barry Gibb and stuff like that. And my point was that, that the thing about it was he, he needed an outlet for his like funk shit. So what he did is he created the time at this, you know, he, cause he was like, look, I can do all this black. I can compete with Rick James. Yeah. I just don't want to make a band that's competing with Rick James in the early eighties. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a band called the time yeah. that's going to fucking compete with Rick James. And at the same time, I'm going to chase after Bob Seger. Cause that motherfucker writes some great songs and he's selling out three nights when I'm only selling out one. <laughs> and I'm going to create a band called the, Re called, uh, the revolution. Yeah. And, and I'm going to do some shit where I'm trying to write songs that can get played on the same radio that Bob Seger's getting played. At. And that, and that shit was always, like uh, it was always amazing to me because as soon as he finally hit it, it took him six records, right? He did a record every year starting at 18 years old and every record was different, man. Prince, For You, Dirty Mind, Controversy, 1999 and then he gets to Purple Rain and he finally fucking hits it and everybody, like everybody's clamoring. They were like, we love Purple Rain, we love Purple Rain and it's 1984, he puts that out, it's the fucking biggest thing in the world, he wins, wins the Oscar and shit for, for, and then all of a sudden 1985, they're like, we want some more Purple Rain and what does he do? He flips it, he flips script on him and comes yeah. out with fucking around the world in the day. <laughs> he, and, and it's never, he never comes back the no, same. No, no. Every time. <laughs> complete, everybody was like, what the, what the fuck? We wanted more Purple Rain and they were pissed off at him and shit like that. And you, you know, and he was like, no, nope, this is my, this is my Sergeant Peppers. Fuck mm -hmm. all y'all. I'm going around the colors around. Mm -hmm. And so kind of back to your point, like for us, I think we had finally hit a point where, look, we did this, we did this demo and our story, our story is different in that we did this demo and then, uh, you know, we're playing on it in LA for a year, we recorded this demo. We didn't even know each other as a band. We recorded it all in one room live and sitting around looking at each other. And then a year later, we're playing on the Jules Holland show and we're taking <laughs> off. And then we have to tour on that fucking record that we made for two in two and a half days for a thousand dollars. We have to tour on that record for four years. Damn. So you, you're touring on this record and we never really got a chance to do a lot of the other music that we wanted to do. So you take a song like Nobody Told Me, which is which is great. And it's got this particular style. Well, now all of a sudden people love us for a particular sort of like garagey there was a certain type style. of sound, right? Yeah. And then, and then you know, we wound up, we, we couldn't even get off the road long enough on the ACDC tour. We did two tours with ACDC. It was, it was like it was like 50 plus shows, all stadium shows all, all over the world. And we couldn't even get off the road long enough to do the, another record that people we're expecting this was like four years in five years in and we we signed with um with blue note and we're working with and we couldn't even take the time to get a producer because we're just working so much still torn on this other record and finally don was throws up his hands he was the ceo of blue note at the time and he was like he was like fuck it i'll produce you guys' record and we're like, okay, cool. Well, he produced the Stones, you know, and 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 he's, you know, no, nothing, no, not too no bad. big deal, <laughs> legendary. But even then, we took eleven days to make this 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 record, and we still hadn't figured out how to become like re recording artists. Still at that time, you know, where where we love the rough and tumble aspect that we got thrown into the machine with, you know, which was just get us get us in a room and hit the record button. But the records that we love and stuff like that, the, when I really drill down on that, you you want to you want to kick? Uh, is that Rufy kicking that I just gave you? <laughs> you all right? Yeah, okay. Let me know if that was too strong. I'll I'll dial down <laughs> the GHB. <laughs> no, but uh, that's been the struggle as of late. Is is we have a we have tons of songs. We have so many songs, and then but getting it heard, getting it to where somebody hears that you heard it. You know, because and, and for whatever reason, and for whatever reason, people came about us at that time because of Jules Holland. 
now we have equally as, as amazing songs that are socially conscious, for example. Yeah, I you like know, that. you know, and and the funny thing is, is nobody wants to fuck with socially conscious songs. Like people, no. people, a lot of like, like, uh, you know, if we want to co-op with, you know, maybe a particular uh, brand, or, or if we want to try and get with a, a a campaign, if we're trying to put together a campaign, people are like, yeah, no, we we like the. Uh, you know the the ballad about losing you know losing your your partner about yeah. heartbreak and shit. Yeah. And it's like, okay, well that I get it. That's been told a thousand times and shit. Yeah. There's some fucked up shit going on right now that we're really passionate about. The people we have a song called "The Battle's End," for example, yeah. that's that's new and you know all hands in together. We are where it begins. Unite our stance. March to one drum. Before our time comes undone, let us be the battle's end. Right, and nice. it's it is a uniting message yeah. that I think uh, you know needs to be heard. The problem is you know now. You know, even with a band like us, no matter what way you go, um, you know, the, there's it's like, okay, well, do you just get in a room and rec record it like the old bomb shelter style, or do you say, I love a Pharrell track, or we're all, you know, guys that are, you know, really aficionados of great producers? I love Mark Ronson. Ronson ain't never gonna let anything out the fucking door that's not, you know, that's not fire. put together, that's not fire, that's not yeah. done. You know, and one of the, I, there was an interview with with Adele a while back, and she said one of the greatest bits of advice she ever got in her career was from Rick Rubin that says quality control is going to be your hardest thing as you start moving up the ladder, mm -hmm. because the tendency with with I think where social media is nowadays and how easy it is to put something out, and you're going to read about the story about a 17 year old kid girl or Grimes, yeah. you know, they got the deal with Jay Z. Yeah. Grimes was doing shit out of her bedroom or out of the bedroom, out of a laptop with 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 GarageBand. Yeah. You do that one time. It gets you in the game. Yeah. But then you, you know, doing that again, it's like now all of a sudden you're getting judged next to Avicii and you're yeah. getting judged next to, you yeah. know, fucking Pharrell and you're getting yeah. judged next to Bruno. And now you can't, you can't, you can't judge your art on the same level anymore. And then you got to watch the voices is getting in your head, like, you know, telling you shit when nobody told me when we, when we did that, that was the first song we ever did as a band together. It was it was coming from this honest place, and in order to keep, I think it felt, dude. Uh, it, uh, according to all your other catalog, like you got Blues Hand Me Down, you got Nancy Lee, all those are in the similar vein. Sure. They're in that sure. garage funk, high pace, everything. Right, right. Nobody told me. Speaks from yeah. your heart. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. it comes from. Well, so a does different Not Alright by Me. Yes. You yes, know, Not Alright by Me is from that same batch, and we have the same things now. But if you try, if we try to put that out now. People would just say, "Okay, it's not done." The people that are the the, the sort of gatekeepers that want to invest and in, and you believe me, you need people that invest, not necessarily money, but mm -hmm. there are people that control. They control what's getting on the playlists and stuff like that. That, are, mm -hmm. that, are, that would listen to something and say, "Okay, I think you guys need to have this remixed," you know, yeah. or whatever. That's the modern. <laughs> yeah. That's the modern yeah, turn yeah. about it not being done, right? Yeah. You need to maybe you know remix this or whatever. And so, Jezebella <laughs> featuring Diplo. Yeah, exactly. And so, what happens is you start to become. Then now you're in a now you're in a thing where you start second guessing yourself. And once you start listen, once you start having to fucking battle the voices inside yeah. your head. You, you you can be fucked, and you know yeah. that's that's where that's where one of the things is. We unfortunately we had to change over agents. Mm. At the same time, we finally released this new record that we just put out, and it's the obviously it's the fucking stupidest thing you could do is release a new record and 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 have to change over agents. But it was necessary. It was a it was a step backwards to take a longer you know moves forward. Yeah. And so, you know, agents book about a year out and stuff like that. So we've had about six months where you, you know, one of the things you don't want to do is put out a new record where you're really, really fucking proud of it, but it's different. And then you don't want to be sitting at home reading your YouTube comments because yeah. there is, no, first of all, Twitter is, you know, fucking, you, there's nothing, there's no, it's nothing but negativity on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And YouTube comments, for the most part, we had had nothing up until that point, but, 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 you know, there was no bad comments on anything that we ever did. Yeah. And we shifted gears with the same songs. A lot of the songs that were written the same exact way. If you heard the demos from 2010 and you listen to the demos of 2016, mm. they're the same band. <laughs> they're the same fucking songs. They're the same everything. We were just playing around with trying to get it right, trying to arrange shit better, trying to make sure they hit the speakers harder, trying yeah. to and trying to branch out a little bit, you know, trying to be, you know, like our artists and take mm. some chances and take some liberties, but, mm. but be behind it. Never do anything that wasn't coming straight from the heart. 
right? Mm-hmm. We've just had to be sitting at home. And so the, 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 you know, the thing is you got to watch it because if you never read your own YouTube comments and, and, you know, never, you know, when you put something out, make sure you're on yeah. the road promoting I worry, it. At I the worry same about time. you, bro. Yeah. I worry about you getting stuck down the rabbit hole. Yeah. I feel like yeah. You, yeah. you, you as an individual are so passionate about yeah. everything. And I feel like that is one of your, um, admiring strengths. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that comes through in your music. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely, and and but I think that's that's what's setting your new stuff apart from y'all's old catalog. But in the same vein, I'm like Rick, man, I love you. Don't get don't get stuck in the trap of trolls, bro. Like, well, uh, know, no, 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 no. I, I know stop. that you have I, 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 I don't. I'm, I don't. I'm saying, but I can yeah. see how you can get caught up in it, and and it's easy yeah. to do because. Yeah. Look, man. I mean, one of the hardest things to do, especially in a band of four alpha males, mm-hmm. is to uh, is to be vulnerable and is to um, leave your ego at the door. Like, yes. leave, like checking your ego, yeah. you need yeah. it to be bad motherfuckers and to have yeah. all the swagger that we have. But then when you're together, you're supposed to check that shit at the door and yeah. they don't teach you how to do that shit. There's no class that teaches yeah. you how to do that. Um, like, oh, close thing, you got a sports, sports, like being on a basketball team together. Cause you know, you got like, like how they got these Golden State teams and all these stars yeah. on the same team to learn how to actually win. You can put a lot of stars on the same team, but they don't work together. They don't play together, just like the USA team with Jordan and all them. They got beat by Chris Webber and all yeah, them right. with a bunch of college kids because the coach daily was like, oh, y'all don't need to listen to me? Okay, I'm gonna let you fuckers just go out there and do what you want. Yeah. He sat Michael Jordan down a little bit and them kids smoked them old dudes. Yeah. All our great stars, <laughs> Larry Bird, all totally. them dudes got smoked. Totally, and, totally. And it's just what he said. You gotta work, you gotta check that shit at the fucking door. You gotta check it and and yeah. uh, it's, it's hard to do because it requires, uh, I think, a grounding in uh, self-confidence that sometimes, you know, we all go through biorhythmic places. And, um, you know, one of the things about uh, uh, being, uh, this is this is interesting. We've been very fortunate now to have a lot of, uh, we won't put any names out there, but a lot of famous friends that are in this, this situ- situation. We're, you know, biggest bands in the world that are now dear friends of ours. And, and um one of them, we were out late at night. Uh, one night, he he grabbed, you know, he kind of grabbed my head, and he was like, he was like, basically grabbing it, saying, "Don't let somebody else screw up your career. Yeah. You know, do everything you can to keep because a band, it is a team. Whereas if I was Kendrick Lamar, if somebody on my team is fucked up, I just fire that person. Yep. In a band, um, there was something. There's something magical about the four of us that that uh, we shouldn't be together. You know, uh, on paper, <laughs> none of it should be together. None of it works together. But you put it all together, and it's something really. It's something that is completely unique and cannot be duplicated. And it that is a is it's a chemistry that um, it's the same like the Rolling Stones. If you listen to the Rolling Stones, if you were to solo out the music of the Rolling Stones, they're not playing together. You know, because Charlie Watts is listening to Keith Richards and fuck, you know, what drummer listens to a guitar player that's drunk all the time, right? And he's sloshing all over the place and the bass player doesn't sound like he's playing, but you put it all together and it's the fucking Rolling Stones and you probably try to put anybody else in the Rolling Stones and it's not going to be the Rolling Stones. It's kind of the same thing with Vintage Trouble. And that's the part that has been the hardest as of lately is we have all this material that we really, really believe in and we haven't had a chance to go... Our our biggest strength where 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 it works out for us is when we're playing, because we work it out on stage. We work a lot of things out on stage, mm-hmm. and if we can't go out on stage, well then you know then then what happens is you you lose a lot of the superpower that um, makes you remember that that sort of great chemistry. And mm-hmm. uh, you know if I was to give advice to anybody, there's definitely a difference. You cannot treat a band like a solo artist. No, you, you can't. You can't think no about it. it. It would be like it would be like Tiger Woods trying to examine his golf game, mm-hmm. and then trying to examine my golf game if I'm on, on the on the team in the Ryder Cup. You know, the golf is a horrible analogy, but I'm just trying to say like, <laughs> golf is a thing where you're battling yourself, mm-hmm. right? And say, you know, your basketball analogy is the greatest analogy because mm-hmm. because uh, because you get the guy, the high profile free agent comes yeah. in and he's you know and he's not fucking paying attention to anybody mm-hmm. and it's like yeah I'm a bad motherfucker I'm gonna win this all on my own yeah. and then the team can't win because yeah. it's got no chemistry man that, that's why Carmelo Anthony yeah <laughs> <laughs> exactly and for me I, I I think it's 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 actually been nice to kind of have this break we've never had a break and we've had this break to where we actually get to sort of realize you know and kind of uh, get back to 
um, you know, the nice thing about the new music and some of the some of the directions that we've taken is it feels forward leaning, which we desperately needed as a band. We needed to feel like we were because um, we're children. Yes, we came from that late fifties, early sixties. But look, man, I mean, I went through everything from Nirvana to Black Eyed Peas. You know, yeah, I went through all the, all the different phases, that, you know, that, that, to G Love. And, to G Love. To, I went through all the <laughs> shit that's just naturally in my G-Love. thing. You know, I, I'm a big hip hop guy. I'm a big, I love great pop music, man. I love, you know, I, there's a lot of things like that. And, and there's no way that that can't in, work its way, you know, that it's going to seep into what I, what I do, you know, musically and what we do musically. Same with Ty, same with Nale, and same with Richard. And so it's just, I think the, the, the key for a team slash band is there's nobody, there's no referee there. Uh, see, a team at least has a fucking coach that can come in and smack them in the face. Yeah. And yeah. say, and say, you know, Phil Jackson, that's why Phil Jackson, that's why Phil Jackson, 20 minutos. That's why Phil Jackson was so badass. Cause yeah. he could come in and, and brush up and be like, you know, sit Kobe and Shaq down and be like, okay, y'all motherfuckers are going to work this out or we're not yeah. leaving here. Yeah. We don't. We haven't had that in a band, and and I think um, you know uh, we're starting to realize that you know in a band, largely you have to take that responsibility onto yourself, and so it's um, it's all part of the journey. And I'm excited about where um, I'm excited about the challenge, as difficult as it gets. You know, it all looks like just you know nothing but coke and whores on the outside. Oh yeah, best part. Yeah, which there's a ton, there is a ton of that. There's a lot of that, but but no, I, I'm looking forward to uh, trying to get back to that passion element that you know that you were saying that that you loved about nobody told me. It's there. It's there in everything we've got. We've just I think uh, there's a um, there's a there's a zone where you've all got to give and you've got to yield some of your ego. Too. And that's the part that that's the, that's been the most troubling thing I've probably ever had to uh, you know ever wrestle in my in my entire life. And it's great because it's your it winds up being your life's mission, and it's it's it, it defines me so much of you know what I do for a living and my livelihood. But it is the most challenging thing I've ever done is having to make that work. I mean, imagine living on a in a bus for 10 months yeah. straight with the same four people, you know, and if... if yeah. you oh, I would definitely not be able yeah. to live with people. Oh, <laughs> yeah, if you don't have... If you don't have a, a ton of emotional tools in your emotional tool bag, and if you don't have... If you're not doing self-care... Mm-hmm. That's why it's so easy to get yeah. caught up in drugs. Drugs yeah. are so fun, yeah. you know. It's like Dude, that I was can just check out. Yeah, bitch. yeah. Well, t- take, take it from it the away. skin bags. We know about all these kind of troubles, from fist fights to yeah. girls stealing yeah. to arguments to I'ma kill you to we're cool to let's have an MMA fight yeah. to everything. And and it's all love at the end of the day. I, I don't know. We're like Spartan men. You know? Yeah, I don't yeah. know what's wrong with it. But I have the emotional like maturity like of Simple Jack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the bottom line is, is no matter what, talk about the ego. Goes and this, we've talked yeah. about this many, many times over the years. Just never forget where you came from. Yeah, sure. Go back yeah. to that. Yeah, sure. That but, is like, but again, know, that, te- that that's again, your, that's your grounding. We, if you go like, we're like, like, say, I've been in therapy, right? We've been in the. We, uh, it, I'm, 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 we're not ashamed to admit it. We've been in therapy mm-hmm. as a band, right? Mm-hmm. And one of the things that they will say is, one of the things is, you have to have two willing participants Absolutely. to get to where you just said. So if you said, okay, never forget where you came from. Okay, cool. Well, one of the people is fine and say the other one is not there. Okay, you yeah. can't do anything until the other person is there and has expressed a willing express to want to change and then has to be accountable for their actions. Yeah. If sure. there merely is a point where you're not accountable, if people aren't taking accountability for their actions, you have nowhere to go. Yeah, You have yeah. nowhere to start if you don't have two willing participants. I have a question. Did you four. notice there was an increase in this as you guys got more successful? Uh, that's a great question. I don't. I, th- I think what it was is it wasn't necessarily the success as it was the pressure level. Ah. I think what it is is the the pressure level. Um, I used to hear about oh Rihanna needs to take thirty days in Betty Ford for exhaustion, and I'd be like, what the fuck? She got to be exhausted. About? <laughs> she flies private. Her weave is too tight. Her weave is too tight. Yeah, yeah. She she be flying private and shit. But 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 no, I understand it. I, I feeling it, it is a real exha- exhaustion is a real tangible thing. We were. I forget. I, I think we're out with who are we out with? Uh, I think we were out with Trumbo and Shorty or something. And I was in New York and I was walking around New York. I had, uh, I think was was probably what I would equate to like a nervous breakdown. And I couldn't. I, luckily, I was on the phone with my mom at the time. And I sat down. I sat down in the middle of like Fifty Seventh and Six. I just sat down on the street because I didn't know where the, where I was, mm. and I couldn't kind of inter. I couldn't 
take on things anymore uh, as far as like sensory things. Like I couldn't feel beauty anymore. I couldn't, yeah. I couldn't feel to what it felt like to feel not tired. I couldn't feel like well, what... You kind of just shut down like it was like a robot almost for a second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I had somebody that was uh, a, a good friend that said, hey, go talk to this doctor. I talked to this guy and luckily he was treating with Neil Patrick Harris who was doing Hedwig at the time. Oh, nice. he, was, he was doing eight shows a week at Hedwig and he had also uh, helped uh, Dave Grohl, I think. I think it was Dave. Or, or James Hetfield or somebody, but it was uh, there's a thing called emotional. Uh, oh, it's called uh, what is it? Uh, fuck, I can't. No, I can't. It's uh, it's it's where all of your body's uh, 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 um, everything you use serotonin, dopamine, oxytocin, everything is drained, and you you no longer can produce any of it. So what it, what it is, it, it's basically, and performers have it because hmm. especially musicians have it the most. Hmm. And so what happens is you're, all of a sudden you have to be on at eight in the morning because you're doing a radio interview. Then you have to be on at four in the afternoon uh, in a different time zone for a meet and greet. Then you have to do the seven, the pre-show meet and greet. Mm -hmm. Then you do the show and all the natural sort of adrenaline that comes from that. Then you do the after show thing. Yeah. Then you go and then you get on the bus and now you're changing time zones again and stuff like yeah. that. And you may have to go in the next day and everything's yeah. thrown off and you never have a full chance to get into any kind of rhythm yeah. to build to build back um, what it is. And Jesus Christ, it's, most, it's I can't think of the name, but it's something fatigue. It's, yeah. and, and so you have none of it in there. And and that was where I think all of us sort of collectively, the stress was on us to where yeah. in, in, in retrospect, management should have given us probably forced us to get off the road. Yeah. But when things are popping, it's hard to say no to the money. Yeah. And that's understandable. Yeah, 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 it's hard to say no. And it's hard to say no to the opportunities because you're like, man, you're going to maybe not get that opportunity again. Yeah. So you go do shit at the danger, at the jeopardy of your own health. And all you have to do is look at, look at Avicii. Yeah. And... Look, and look, you gotta be superstar fucking good doing it. At Every the same day, time. you gotta be on point. Look at look at you know when they put when they put Amy Winehouse back out and she fell down off the fucking stage. I remember that day, you know, or even watch the Avicii documentary. It's mm -hmm. it's it's mind blowing. If you haven't seen it, it's it for me especially. I it it it, it physically hurt me to watch because I saw that point where they were like, look, you're getting, you know, 400 grand. All you gotta go do is just go do this, and they're forcing this on him, and he's like, I can't do anything and then they come back in and okay well how about if we just do this do this and then he keeps saying okay okay because he can't let these people down can't let yeah. these people down and he keeps doing it keeps doing it until he fucking kills himself yeah. do you think that affected prince because i know he had the bad hips and whatnot from doing all the splits and jumping off pianos for 20 years and they said his hips got real painful so he had to take a lot of drugs for it do you think that push to perform and that push for the money you know do you think that kind of happened to him almost to a certain extent i i I I have a lot of I have dear friends that are in that camp and and we're in his band and, and are that are really close to it. I so I have a little bit of insight that I'll try to be sort of cautious here. But I, mm. I to to answer it probably without sort of divulging anybody's trust. Mm. But um, I will say this: uh, the, a certain religions, you know, it's, it's a well known fact that he was you know Jehovah's Witness and ah, stuff like yes, that. Yes. You can't. I think what is it? You can't have the like, the blood transfusion. You're not yes, supposed to I have the blood transfusion. Yeah. And and he had. You know, he went ahead and and had uh, the hip surgery mm -hmm. because you know, and then and then to go about it, managing the pain. He was managing the pain in secret, mm -hmm. and I think yeah. that that yeah, he covered it up good. I had no idea. Even when I seen him with the cane, I thought he was just being fly and shit. I don't think it was a. Yeah. It, he he, he yeah. was he was a naturally an artist. He was going to be like 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 BB King or like Chuck Berry. He was going to die performing, mm -hmm. you know. But it shouldn't have been at that time. I think because he had to do that surgery to himself or whatever yeah. under the, you know, right. uh, under, uh, he had to do it in secret. And so, so he can't His no whole recovery, there yeah. was no, he could not be honest with it, which yeah. meant that he couldn't, he, he couldn't be transparent about it. Yeah. It'd be another thing if he could live out in the open about what he needed to help himself, yeah. he would have had support at every step along yeah. the way. Yeah, it's almost like he's hiding being gay or something or something like yeah. that. Yeah, like he had no, he had no support fun. structure, yeah. so he's popping you know, Oxycontin's on the sly, and the thing about it is, as we all know now, fentanyl is not to be fucked with, man. Right. Fentanyl, fent fentanyl will Take kill. No, yeah. no, yeah. especially coming from Florida. Yeah, no, bro, it's, uh, yeah, it's everywhere. Well,
I think this is a, a better time than any to ask you what is your words of wisdom <laughs> to the, the up and comer. I know you touched on a couple points that you said if you had some words of wisdom, it would be this and it would be that. And we, we, dude, you've made my job this today so easy. I'll just ask you one question. You just talk for like twenty yeah, minutes. Well, it's been I, beautiful. I, I love it. I hope it's. I hope it's good. Oh I mean, my I, god, yeah, it's yeah, fucking yeah. phenomenal. Yeah, Are you we kidding even, me? We didn't even get. On. I was hoping somebody was going to ask me something like 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 politically charged, man. Dude, that, you know I, what I'm saying? I, that's <laughs> what I'm saying. Well, that's my shit. I am extremely controversial, but they they don't like you know they they say skid bags is not endorsed or anything the Mississippi enforcer says the punishment of law or rejection from society. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can so, say whatever you but want. You know I me, mean? I get I get started. You know what I mean? I'm about to start running for president soon. I'm about to be announcing that in a couple of weeks. You know what I mean? Word. So I got my little thoughts. I'm behind you, dog. But not I got no, my thoughts. No, I will I will I will say this because he's a, he's a dear friend of of ours, and uh, it's only the only way that this story works. I'll. I, divulge his name, but we were out one night and somebody started, it was like four o'clock, it was a house party in the Hollywood Hills, as, as you do. Mm. And uh, it was great, it was fun. we were having a blast, and somebody started talking about, um, a, you know, a political, you know, hot button, I don't know, like, you know, killing 3,000 Puerto Ricans, you oh, know, yeah, wi right. willingly, or, you know, yeah. you're, you know, actually separating thousands of kids permanently from their parents. Yeah. Um, but say it was some hot button, and, and, and people say, no talking, there is no religion and no yeah. politics at, at this party, yeah. nobody's talking like that, and I was, with, I was with Julian Lennon at the time, and Julian goes, hold on, I'll respect that because it's your house, mm -hmm. but I just want to say, if this was the late 60s at a, at a at a house party in the hills here you wouldn't be allowed in this par in this party if you didn't Yep. Talk about yep. social or uh, uh, political issues they'd have called, uh, of they'd the probably time. Called her a fascist back then. If, if you would have been, been talking, party. yeah, if you would have been talking really? about some bullshit about the Kardashians or some kind of fucking flippant bullshit, mm -hmm. you would have been kicked out of the party. Mm -hmm. uh, Same thing about the late 1700s. Yeah, you know, like I mean, you want to take it back? Let's mm -hmm. take it back. Like you think you go into a pub and people are not talking politics? Yeah, yeah well, and back back somebody reminded the me the other day, politics is 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 you know extension of the word policy, and policy is something that affects everything. Everybody, you know, and, and policy are the are the policies that are in place that we all have to live by, that we all sort of help each other by, that we, you know, the people sort of the, get a leg up by, you know, and these things should be discussed and stuff like that. So sorry to 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 you know, move the question over, no, and we, we won't we won't yes. talk about that. But I I just think you know one of the things I got I get I caught a lot of shit talking online. And I still do. And people like, you know, Me you should... Me too, bro. Yeah. A bunch of 30-day Facebook blocks over this Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And they're, they're like, you know, I hate it when, you know, Meryl Streep or something fucking talks at the Oscars about some shit. Yeah. It's like, you know what? You know, everybody talks about uh, uh, things that bother them. That's what fucking, you know, social media is for and stuff like mm -hmm. that. These people just have a platform. And I think it is... If your platform is, is a platform... Uh, where you're trying to help people or you're trying to increase awareness or at least mm -hmm. in, in, increase a conversation. Yeah. At least be talking about it and having things out there to where people have to think about di the different sides of things. That's healthy. To me, that's a hell of a lot healthier than, you know, some bullshit like 10 ways to, mm -hmm. you know, fuck your man better or some shit, whatever it is on the cover of <laughs> Cosmopolitan and shit like that. So, influence. You want to <laughs> you want well, to talk uh, about influence? I think influence. It's, this, I, I, I don't really know if that's got, an influence. I really got to insert this. I really yeah. want to make a distinction about uh, you actually care and articulate your thoughts, whereas Carl antagonizes and he's a troll <laughs> no, just for the not. sake of fucking with people. I just, so I, I want our listeners to be clear tracks. about, yeah, 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 I don't yeah, want to yeah, yeah. make a direct just, comparison to just, those I just, I just try to start a little trouble. That's just, just a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I just yeah, lay yeah. it down. Just I just go bit. like this. I go like this. Oh, right, right, right. And then I just sit back in the corner and just wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Just, well, re just remember the next time somebody says no talk politics, that means don't talk policy. And if you're not talking policy, then you're not talking about the actual laws mm -hmm. and the power that is affecting everybody in so in almost all the things you do outside and even inside your house on a daily basis. You need to know the policies that are in place on the on the things that are going down. Unfortunately, everybody's just been turned off and thinks that that government is not useful or is being sold a lie that government is not useful. And when you get to travel the world like we do, I mean, uh, I'll say this super fast. So we were in Norway and I'm on this break and I'm sitting there, we played this, this festival in Norway, it was really killer. We sit down, these three, I'm sitting here talking to these three girls, they're real good good looking girls and I'm sitting there and I'm talking at the at the food line, we're sitting there. Before I know it, there, there are three lawyers and they start telling me about their situation. I love talking to people about you know what's going on with them and I understand Norway is a case study in and of itself, but 
there's not any trash on the ground. You know, it's, it's this gorgeous, gorgeous place that operates outside of, of it's, it's, it might as well be its own planet. Yeah. And one of the girls had just battled cancer mm. and had did not have to, she got, got through it, did not have to bat, battle it, did not have to pay for it financially. And this, this stressful burden that healthcare in and of itself yeah. puts on people that, that they didn't have, she's like, I didn't have to deal with it. And then she wound up, the school and their education, the school and the medication got taken care of. And they all had these, you know, jobs and they were happy. They have, you know, healthcare and things are, things are taken care of as far as their, their mental health are mm -hmm. things that, that they look at really, really hard. And you see an ecosystem like that, that is, that is working the way that does. And then you have to come home and deal with the, 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 the idiotic and infantile sort of discussions on things that are proven to work other places. Uh -huh. All you have to do is get a passport yep. and go see it. And yep. you know, that's what gets frustrating to me is yep. when you're arguing about something, saying it won't work when you've seen it work mm -hmm. in other places, it's very frustrating. Well, you know what the biggest lie in America is, is that your vote don't count, the government don't work, mm -hmm. and facts don't matter. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? In proven situations, uh, such as balancing of money and using certain funds and, and getting things to work evenly, like like single payer, yeah. which everybody really wants, and those kind of things. Yeah, <laughs> people, it, it works. Yeah, Dude, you it guys works. are preaching to the choir. You're yeah. talking. I'm, you know, this is coming from the blind hemophiliac. Yeah. But be, be glad we live in California because California might as well be its own fucking country. Thank yeah. God, church, hallelujah, because we're the fifth largest economy in the world, so we can tell the rest of the country go fuck itself, and yeah. we've been doing it. And I, I'm actually that's why I love this state, man. Yeah, I love this state too. too. So anyway, and the last you wanted to ask about the you know, sorry, I want I keep, well I, it did, I think I I think there's no better way to round us out and I think uh on that note we were talking about I love this state and I was like I love your contribution to the state <laughs> I love your presence as a human being oh, I'm thanks, so baby. grateful to have known you throughout my life man yeah, it really likewise, does likewise. It really, dude I remember just going backstage with you in Orlando at a concert with me and my boys and you came and I bought a vinyl of bomb shelter sessions and everybody signed it and you were like yo this is my boys you may feel so <laughs> So special. <laughs> Everyone was like, "Who is this motherfucker?" Yeah, I'm like, "Yes, yeah, my boy Rick." Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna be back. We're gonna be back in Tampa in two weeks. Play the show, so it should oh, be interesting. Saw that. Nice. Yeah, it should be interesting. Well, um, thank you so much for coming on. We got yeah. you got an open invite, dude. I gotta have you back on. Like whenever you, you are the busy one, so you let me know when you're in town because uh, I I just thoroughly enjoy every conversation that we have. I feel like we could talk for four or five hours. Yeah, we can go, no, we can go man, on. I, I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, um, we are. We're about to go back out. We're gonna do. Let the people know. Let yeah. the, tell, say what's up. What do you so, got coming yeah, up? Yeah. VintageTrouble.com. We're uh, we're about Trouble to make us? go be back in Europe in March. Then we go do. We're doing the. 30th anniversary, we're headlining uh, the largest festival in Australia, which is a festival called Byron Bay Blues Fest down there. And uh, then we're, we're doing, we're going to mess up Australia, then we're going to head up to Japan, and I think even pop over possibly due to Korea, and then we're back uh, in the States for a little bit, doing some States, and then going back to Europe for late summer, so we we are going to be busy the rest of the year, but everything's on VintageTrouble.com, and if you want me here, man, if I'm in town, just holla. Holla. Dude, Text open the motherfucker. invite. Yeah. You know, now we link back up. It's been long overdue. Yeah, it no, I love it. I love but it. Thanks I for having me too. out. Dude, give my best to the, uh, to the rest of the band, to the fam. We'll you do. know, we got we'll nothing do. but love. And yeah. I can't wait to see you guys in, in person again yeah. and live, killing the game. Yeah, baby. Uh, like you said, VintageTrouble.com. Uh, Check your shit out, man. I don't even know how to end this podcast. I'm, I'm flabbergasted right now. You just oh. dropped a wealth of knowledge and information and love and heartache and soul and music. God yeah. damn. Break yeah. tail off in the building. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Skip X Radio. We out. Skip X Radio.